I just want to make sure everybody is settled and all the accommodations are working right now. We good? <laughs> I'm just getting thumbs up from anybody with accommodation needs. I see our captioning's working. Our interpreters are here. Good? Okay. Well, that was such a wonderful program. I really, I can't thank Peter Hirschfield and all of the candidates for coming out and doing that today. So another round of applause for all of them who are here with us today. So today we celebrate happy 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. VCIL is so honored to be with you today as we take a moment to celebrate the landmark law that gave a promise of inclusion, access to life, and opportunity. I am humbled as I look into the audience and reflect on the accomplishments of our community. I pause as we remember those who we've lost. And I am truly excited to celebrate the young people in our movement who will continue to push us to fully realize disability justice. We celebrate that promise of a law that brought many of us out of the back rooms, out of institutions, and back into the community. And as we rejoice, we know that there's so much more to do and our fight is uneven. Someday I'm gonna write a song called Much More To Do because it seems like that's the lyrics of speeches across the country each 26th of July. Not everyone sees the issues we face as social issues, but rather private problems for us to deal with. We continue to fight daily discrimination, stigma, being seen as special or inspirational. From VCIL's beginnings over 40 years ago, our work has been to envision a world in which people with disabilities and the deaf are able to live their full human potential. We should always be reimagining and focusing on solutions and keeping in the forefront the social impact of a world in which people are oppressed from realizing their full human potential. We have an attendance service program that's been frozen for years, a program in which people with disabilities had, to, had access to supports and were able to keep their assets. When realizing full human potential, we need to ensure that it's not under the guise of saving money or fitting Medicaid demands, but actually supporting people. We know that people with mental health diagnoses supported by peers through mutual support help solve systematic issues that affect people with psychiatric disabilities, but we continue to pump money into systems that create additional harm and not realizing full human potential. We know that restaurants and other businesses continue to deny entrance to our friends who use service animals not embracing full human potential. And we know that students and parents need to fight for basic classroom accommodations and are blocked from full human potential. And we know that doctors still don't pay for American Sign Language interpreters. Full human potential. We know that the social security laws and the benefit cliff when employed as a disabled or deaf individual is outdated and creates systems in which people aren't able to return or continue to work. Full human potential. And we know that parents with disabilities worry about losing their child to a system simply because we have disabilities. Full human potential. When George Bush signed the ADA, he famously said, quote, let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. And in that moment, there was celebration. 32 years later, and brick by brick, we are still slamming at that wall with a sledgehammer. 32 years later, we are expected to be the ones to tear it down. 32 years later, we are not able to embrace our full human potential because the bricks keep coming up like some awful game in Minecraft, swiftly building around us. But there is a law and a law that invites full human potential. A law that people come out to celebrate and embrace. So let's see what that law can do for us. We will rejoice and claim our stake in this world. We are proud to be living with disabilities. We are proud to be living in a world that we are creating. I have such gratitude for people who bring the promise of full inclusion and equity into the light every day. 
Thank you for your passion. In our program today, we're gonna highlight people ensuring that that promise of the wall come tumbling down is achieved and that we will live life to our full human potential and beyond. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce to you two trailblazers in our movement, Ed Paquin and Jenny Milkey. <laughs> Ed and Jenny um, have worked for years in advocacy and for disability rights and older Vermonters. And they are, as they describe, a couple of recovering politicians who have entertained themselves as living room musicians all along the way. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friends, Ed Paquin and Jenny Milkey, with a song that you can find in your program. <laughs> Hi, folks, and, and thank you. Um, I hope people left their tomatoes and their eggs at home. My country seems to me could use more liberty, so hear me sing. Let's open our hearts wide to disability pride. We'll walk and roll side by side. Let freedom ring. A land that's truly free has worked for you and me with equity. Let's show no gratitude for crushing attitudes, old worn out platitudes won't set us free. Our heroes led the way, passing the ADA, access for all. But there's still to do to make the dream come true independent lives for all you see opportunity thank you I was so great. I, I thought we were going to have other songs. I wasn't even ready to jump up. Thank you so much, Ed and Jenny. That was great. Um, I just have a couple <coughs> brief words before I get the honor of introducing our Commissioner of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. Um, what a big day, really. I, I got to be at two ceremonial signings of the ADA, uh, uh, one at my law school when I worked for the American Society of Law and Medicine, and one at Perkins School for the blind, and uh, I remember the Attorney General and, and, and the President George Herbert Walker Bush um, bringing so much excitement with them when those ceremonial signings happened that I made myself watch this morning the, uh, on this date, uh, 32 years ago, on the White House steps, and um, there are a couple quotes that really stood out to me. I'm not gonna talk very long, but. Um, you know, this was a civil rights act. It is a civil rights act. And our civil rights are, in my lifetime, have never been under such attack. And the kind of some sort of renewed scrutiny that is somehow permissible. It's not permissible. I mean, I, I, I think that we all need to continue to question uh, the recent Supreme Court decisions. And, and we need to build um, on this very, very important law. He, he, um, he started his remarks, and I'm no president, but I'll just, it's, it's, it swayed me. He talked about looking out and seeing a splendid scene of hope. You know, and I want there to be a splendid scene of hope. I mean, we were talking a lot about how much work there is yet to go, uh, you know, in the fundamental areas of public accommodation and employment and transportation and state and local government services and telecommunications. Those are the five principal areas of the ADA so much more work to do. Um, um, but that 
piece, that hope piece, just really resonates. And the other thing he said was, and this is a quote because it's not quite as up to, as woke as it should be, but he, he, he said, every man and woman with a dream has to have the ability to realize it. And I think that hope and that desire to make sure we keep working at that realization, which is not yet fully achieved, is really important. Uh, I would be failing not to mention the Olmsted decision in 99, which really helped us get to um, out of institutionalization and to community-based care. We have a strong state with person-centered, person-directed care, and, and we're striving to have the most integrated services possible. So with all that in mind, this is a day of celebration. We are gonna have a celebration here together with you. And, and, and those principles of equality and independence and freedom. Um, we're gonna hear, I'm very happy to, from Adam, he's gonna go a bit more into depth. Um, right now I wanna turn the focus on one of our uh, special guests here today, and we've had many, uh, Commissioner Monica White. Uh, she, uh, yeah, applause is definitely true. I, I, won't, I won't, I won't, I got, I was delighted when I worked in government to have a chance to meet Monica when she came out the Agency of Human Services in the finance capacity. And this is in your program, but I'm gonna read it because God forbid I forget even the details. So um, Monica White was appointed as interim commissioner for the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living, Dale, in March 2021 and formally appointed by Governor Phil Scott as Dale Commissioner in July 2021. She previously spent six years as Dale's Director of Operation, most recently leading the department's COVID-19 response. Monica first joined the Agency of Human Services in 2007, first as Financial Director and then as Director of Healthcare, Operations, Compliance, and Improvement. She previously worked at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont for eight years, focusing on provider contracting and quality improvement initiatives. Monica has also served on numerous boards and organizations as a volunteer throughout her career, including prior service of 13 years as a volunteer firefighter and EMT, an overnight shift volunteer at the Good Samaritan Haven, vice chair of the Twinfield Union School Board, and currently Monica is a trustee of the Barry Fish and Game Club. Monica holds a Bachelor of Science in Healthcare Administration from St. Joseph's College of Maine, a Master of Business Administration from Norwich University, and is a 2014 graduate of the Snelling Center Vermont Leadership Institute. Monica is passionate about Dale's mission to make Vermont the best state in which to grow old or to live with a disability with dignity, respect, and independence. She's honored to lead the incredible staff of Team Dale and the important work alongside many valued community partners to achieve the same. Monica resides in Plainfield with her husband, Jeremy, their three daughters, two dogs, one cat, and if you know, a lot of chickens. <laughs> so, Monica, please come up and address us. Thank you so much. Let's see here. Thank you, Theo. I just realized how really overly long that bio is, so I need to dial that back for the future. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so as noted, my name is Monica White, and I'm the commissioner of the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, also known as Dale. I am delighted to join you here today on this beautiful Vermont summer day in celebrating the 32nd anniversary of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Thank you to the Vermont Center for Independent Living and the Statewide Independent Living Council and for hosting this event and for the congressional candidates who uh, spoke earlier and to you all for being here today. As noted in my overly long bio, Dale's mission is to make Vermont the best state in which to grow old or to live with a disability with dignity, respect, and independence. So many people in this room and beyond work incredibly hard together toward achieving this common goal. On July 26, 1990, our nation moved closer to the fulfillment of its foundational promise when the Americans with Disabilities Act became law. Some of the key tenets of the ADA include the rights to equal opportunity, independent living, and equitable participation in every aspect of life. 
Here in Vermont, that takes many forms. Examples across Dale, working closely with community partners and advocates, include the work of Higher Ability Vermont, the Divisions for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Developmental Services, Adult Services, and Licensing and Protection. For 32 years now, the ADA has made our nation stronger and more inclusive, truly a landmark achievement for American civil rights. The ADA has helped to uphold the dignity of thousands of Vermonters who have a disability. There is still work to be done, as Sarah was saying, um, and I am grateful to work in this field alongside the countless advocates for disability rights in assuring that we will see the full promise that the ADA offers. I was nine when the ADA was enacted. I had little understanding then of the monumental importance of this legislation, but as I reflect back to 1990, my pap Touchette died in January of that year. He was an amputee due to complications of diabetes, and he used a wheelchair. I remember the rustic modifications that my family made to his modest home in Stowe, and I also recall eavesdropping on conversations between my grandparents about how challenging it was to bring PAP anywhere, which I now know was because there were no curb cuts, hallways were too narrow, et cetera, et cetera. Problems that the ADA directly addressed among many other important provisions. Recent data indicates that one in five Vermont adults have at least one disability. I am one of that 20%. As everyone here knows, some disabilities are invisible. In 2019, I was diagnosed with a rare aggressive cancer, endometrial stromal sarcoma, stage 4B. Looking at me here today, you'd likely not know that I underwent multiple life-altering surger surgeries and that my torso and psyche bear significant scars from my cancer. I have been extraordinarily fortunate that my periodic CT scans in the past three years have not yet shown signs of recurrence and I'm reassured and comforted in knowing that the provisions of the ADA will directly make my life easier and better if slash when my cancer returns. So that's my personal disability story, my most personal disability story, but I think it's fair to say that we all owe a debt of gratitude to the countless disability advocates whose years of tireless efforts in fighting for this critically important legislation brought the ADA into existence back 32 years ago. I have the deepest respect and appreciation for all who fought then and for those who continue to strive toward a better future for all Vermonters who have a disability. So thank you again for the opportunity to join on this great day and I'll turn it back over to Theo. Commissioner. Um, so we have a keynote address today um, uh, from Adam Weschler. He is uh, the chair of the Silks Housing Committee. And I have a bio I'm gonna read about Adam and then he's gonna come up and talk to you, with you. Um, Adam Wessler has lifelong experience with disability, having been diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy at a young age. He is a passionate disability advocate, serving as the chair of the Vermont Statewide Independent Living Council's Housing Committee, as a member of Parent Project Muscular Dystrophies Adult Advisory Committee, and as a member of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission's Transportation Advisory Committee. Adam works as a technical support specialist for Resource, a nonprofit community enterprise where he manages a workforce development website for people with disabilities and other barriers. Lastly, Adam is a graduate of the University of Vermont's environmental program, having cultivated his love for nature in his hometown of Jericho, Vermont. Please welcome Adam Weschler.
just fine. I don't know how to. I'm definitely not the tech guy, so. Maybe we can switch it out. Maybe this one, if we moved it down toward you, would that be? I wonder if you can set up. Keep bending it, you say? Okay, here comes a, here comes a, I'm totally not. You know, here we have someone who's going to help us. I was hoping there was someone behind me. <laughs> okay, so maybe it's someone. You want me to yeah, hold maybe it? Maybe hold it if you want. Would that be all right? Comfortable sure. with that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I guess it's a good spot. Do you want a chair? No, but I just want to make sure I'm not too much in your face. Right. What do you think? Uh, right, move it a little closer. Hello? Does that work? A little awkward, but okay. it'll be good. You all right? All right. Uh, thank you, Theo and Commissioner White. Uh, thank you to the congressional candidates and Peter Hirschfeld for a great forum discussion. Is that not working? Not really working. Straight up and down. Okay, here we go. I'm not schooled at this. You think so? But too wide. <laughs> We're going to do it one more time. I'm sorry, Adam. I'm not okay. I'm going to go right like this. All right. Okay. Does this one? All right. There we go. Uh, maybe move it just a little higher. A little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess mic stands aren't very accessible. <laughs> this is part of your presentation. Yep. All right. Um, thank you, Theo and Commissioner White. And thank you to the congressional candidates and Peter Hirschfeld for a great forum discussion. Finally, thank you all for being here today whether online or in person, as we gather to celebrate the 32nd anniversary, the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA. The ADA is rooted in a history of advocacy and activism. From Ed Roberts, a quadriplegic polio survivor, and quote, father of the independent living movement, advocating for himself to stay on the University of Berkeley campus, University of California at Berkeley campus in the 1960s. To the 504 sit-in of 1977, which disabled activists, including Roberts, occupied federal buildings for 28 days, and forced the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to implement the long-awaited anti-discrimination regulations of, the 50, of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And to the Capitol crawl of 1990, where protesters, many of whom relied on mobility aids, crawled up the steps of the U.S. Capitol building demanding the passage of the ADA. Many of the successes of the disability rights movement can be traced back to grassroots efforts like these. As well as the strong leadership of people like Roberts, uh, Deborah Lee C. Baker in Vermont, and Vermont Senator Jim Jeffords in Congress, among many, many others. But the fight is not over. As Justin Dart, quote, the father of the ADA, said after its signing on this day in 1990, the ADA, quote, is only the beginning. It is not a solution. Rather, it is a central foundation on which solutions will be constructed. Indeed, the ADA was transformative, but it did not remove all the inequities people with disabilities faced on day one, nor would anyone expect it to. To that end, the ADA has four purposes. Quote, one, to provide a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Two, to provide clear, strong, consistent, and forceful standards addressing discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Three, to ensure that the federal government plays a central role in enforcing the standards established in this chapter on behalf of individuals with disabilities. And four, to invoke the sweep of congressional authority, including the power to enforce the 14th Amendment and to regulate commerce in order to address the major areas of discrimination faced day to day by people with disabilities. These words, perhaps most noticeably, led to the transformation of the built environment in the United States. All public buildings are now accessible to those with disabilities. Most, if not all, street corners now bear curb cuts. Buses now have lifts and ramps that ADAPT protested for in 1978. Public accommodations became accessible too. Beyond the built environment, though, the ADA also gave protections to people with disabilities in many other areas of society, in education and employment, and in telecommunications, 
enabling those with hearing or speech impairments to use telephones, and in healthcare too. I am glad I was born six years after the signing of this significant legislation. I am lucky that I've only ever known a post-ADA world, a world in which I can make my own decisions, and lucky to have had many courageous act advocates and advocates, advocates and activists come before me. I cannot even begin to thank them all for their sacrifice in the fight to ensure my rights and the rights of 61 million other Americans with disabilities. Taken another way, we are the country's largest minority, spanning all other protected classes, and yet we are the last to receive our civil liberties. Before the ADA and the implementation of important disability rights laws, people with disabilities were routinely discriminated against in all areas of society. Those considered to be, quote, feeble-minded were whisked away from their families to live in, quote, horrible subhuman institutions on the fringes of society where forced sterilization was common. If you're lucky enough to avoid institutionalization, the world was not designed for you. Buildings were not accessible, housing was poor, and curb cuts and ramps were exceptions, not the rule. There were few, if any, interpreters. Many were denied access to public education because of their disability. I'm glad to have never known these realities. I was only ever raised in a world transformed. I was able to attend public education, public school with accommodations where I excelled, later attending the University of Vermont. Every bus I've been on has been accessible, and rarely does a restaurant not have an accessible entrance and bathroom. I can access ge every government building I've been to, uh, many of which are the best models of accessibility, including the most accessible bathroom I've ever used, <laughs> located in the US Capitol building. Though, there have been difficulties too. Now that I'm an adult, I continue to live at home with my parents. Not that I have anything against them, by the way. <laughs> uh, because there are a few places I can live even now. There is accessible housing, but not nearly enough in the places that people want to live. Uh, I could eventually find an apartment, but the harder part is finding attendants to help me with activities of daily living. I currently work a part-time job but finding more substantial work could jeopardize those attendant benefits I need. Although great strides have been made in many of these areas, housing, transportation, education, employment, and telecommunications, many of us with disabilities continue to face challenges in living up to our full potential. Our generation must now build even more solutions on the foundation of the ADA. As we heard today, there are many issues still facing the disability community, from a dearth of affordable and accessible housing to lack of attendant services, to gaps in special education, social security benefits cliffs, and lapses in mental health services. Beyond these issues, enforcement of the ADA remains challenging. And as more and more of our world is taken online, we must ensure that websites are accessible to all, especially those who are blind and visually impaired. We must also ensure disabled voters are not disenfranchised. And we must work to make transportation systems, including airplanes, trains, and cars, better accommodate people with disabilities. In employment, the National Council on Independent Living, or NICL, finds that only 19% of people with disabilities are employed, compared to 66% of non-disabled people. As these issues show, and there are many more, we have our work cut out for us. My hope for the future of the ADA and disability rights in the United States is that we continue to fight for community inclusion as mandated by the 1999 Supreme Court Olmstead decision and the institutional bias still present in the Medicaid system and that people with disabilities have the choice to access fully funded home and community-based services. To support these goals, we must address the issues we heard about today. And we must think about implementing new and creative legislation, such as the 2021 Eleanor Smith Inclusive Home Design Act, which would have ensured that all new single family homes or townhouses receiving federal funding would include visit visitability standards, including zero step entrances, 32 inch hallways and doorways, and an accessible bathroom on the first floor. 
The next frontier would be to eventually include uh, private housing. And legislation to support the millions of unpaid and informal caregivers who take care of their disabled children and parents. And the work of organizations like All Wheels Up, who's looking to implement wheelchair restrainment systems for commercial airliners. My greatest hope is that one day, making society accessible and inclusive to all is not seen as something extra, something that requires accommodations, but just something that we do because it benefits all people. That is the goal of the universal design, making the world usable to quote, the greatest extent possible by everyone, regardless of their age, ability, or status in life. And that we are able to achieve the full integration of people with disabilities into society, eventually transcending the delineation between disabled and non-disabled, recognizing that we are all just people. Thank you, please enjoy the rest of your afternoon. About another round of applause for Adam. That was amazing. Thank you, thank you. Now I have two mics, I guess. So, um, so next, I, it's my honor to introduce Marty Roberts. Um, to many, Marty needs no introduction. A mentor and a leader in disability rights and the psychiatric survivor movement. I've had the pleasure of knowing Marty for over 25 years. And she's here today to present VCIL's Deborah Lisi Baker Youth Leader Awards. So please help me welcome Marty. Thank you. I'm so pleased to see you all here today to celebrate the 32nd anniversary of the signing of the ADA and all the changes it's meant for us in our lives, in our community. And so I'm gonna be presenting the Deborah Lisi Baker Youth Leader Award. This award was created in 2006 by the VCIL Board of Directors in honor of Deborah, who was the previous executive director at VCIL. Um, Deborah had a special interest in youth leadership and she saw the youth as the future of our disability movement. The award recognizes uh, youth with disabilities age 22 and under in our communities who exemplify leadership skills in their organizing efforts and advocacy skills while promoting the civil rights of people with disabilities. Deborah passed away suddenly last March. She had spent a large portion of her life advocating for disability rights. So the first person to whom this award is being presented is Isabel Estrin. And is it Isabel here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Isabel was born a double congenital amputee and has had no choice really but to be an activist because her disability is so visible. She cares deeply about working to create a more just and inclusive world. She graduated from NYU Tisch in 2022 with a major in acting and a minor in disability studies. Throughout her four years, Isabel acted as an advocate and activist within the university against ableist practices in acting careers. acting classes, I'm sorry. She worked with performers and administration to change the curriculum, encouraging the university to shift away from the outdated practice of training actors to perform disabilities and instead uh, encouraging professors and caster, casting directors to employ disabled actors. She is currently working as a consultant for educators in Vermont who are creating a Designing for Disability engineering course. Isabel is an influencer on TikTok where she shares her own experiences and educates others about issues related to living and creating as a di disabled artist. She has over 130,000 followers 
uh, from around the world and has created a community for other disabled artists and activists. Last summer, she worked as an advisor in residence supporting students with disabilities at Landmark College. Isabel mentors younger children with limb differences as a youth leader through Helping Hands Foundation, a group she has belonged to and worked with since she was two. And so here's, here's Isabel. <laughs> <laughs> and these the, 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 the. <laughs> Congratulations. Our second award recipient is Sean Plummer. Sean is always seeking to learn more information about himself. He always wants to develop and learn new things. One of the challenges in working with Sean is that he always says yes and he is always busy. Is, is Sean here? <laughs> when he first learned about his visual impairment, Sean became invested in understanding as much as he could about his vision loss and how to improve his self-advocacy and confidence skills. The, the Learn, Earn, and Prosper, or LEAP program in Burlington hired Sean as a virtual facilitator this past year. Sean facilitated online meetings with groups of young people to develop connection, a feeling of psychological safety, to build self-advocacy and confidence skills and relationships. Sean also works for Resource in Burlington, and he has great work, a great work ethic. He's always curious, and he's a team player who is nominated, who is committed uh, to support for others. This year, Sean, Sean facilitated breakout rooms during the division meetings that led to updates within DBVI's state plan. One new participant on the DV, DBVI uh, SRC noted Sean's ability to bring a sense of ease into the meeting and his ability to make people feel comfortable, and to draw people into conversations. Sean is an Eagle Scout and is currently a counselor in training for a summer camp. He participates in Braille competitions, is a cross-country runner, and is active in music and theater. So we present the award to Sean. And there is a third uh, recipient of an award. Uh, she is right now in Washington, D.C. at the National Council on Independent Living Conference. And her name is Hannah Gallivan. Thanks so much, Marty. So this ends our, our, mostly ends our program. I'm gonna invite our friends Ed and Ginny back up to give us a couple more closeout songs. I can't thank you enough for joining us today and um, staying with us. Congratulations to our award recipients um, and we can't wait to see what you're about to continue to do in the future. Thanks again to everybody for coming. And take it away, Ed and Ginny. Okay, this, um, what we're gonna play next is, I think it's the last one in your book, um, and it's, <clears throat> it's not really a song about disability, except that it's a song from a people um, who face oppression. And so I guess in that sense, it is a song about disability. Um, and it, it's by a couple of pretty wild Scotsmen that, used to record a long time ago called The Proclaimers. I could tell the meaning of a word like serene. 
I got some old grades when I was 16. I can tell the difference between margarine and butter. I can say Saskatchewan without starting to stutter. But I can't understand why we let someone else rule our land. Cap in hand. Get good and close to the mic, Jenny. <clears throat> I could get a broken jaw from being in a fight. I know it's evening when day <laughs> turns to night. I could understand why Stran Rayer lies so lowly. They could save a lot of points by signing Hibbs goalie. But, but I can't understand why we let someone else rule our land. Cap in hand, we fight when they ask us. We boast, then we cower. We beg for a piece of what's already ready, what's already ready, what's already ready, ours. Oh, what's already ready, what's already ready, what's already ready, eyes. Once I thought I could make God a bribe. So I said I was in his lost tribe. Getting handouts can be so frustrating. Get in line, son, there's five million waiting. I can't understand why you let someone else rule your land. Cap in hand. No, I can't understand why you let someone else rule your land. Cap in hand, cap in hand, cap in hand, cap in hand. I can't understand why we let someone else rule our land. Cap in hand. I guess my apologies to the proclaimers, too. Um, this is another one that maybe wasn't written specifically as a disability song. But I think, you know, I think about, on a day like this, I think about the disability community. And community is something, you know, writ large. We think all the people around that have disabilities. But it's also, I think, meaningful in the way that um, we with disabilities are there for each other and help pull each other through. It's our own advocacy that got the ADA <laughs> passed. It's our advocacy that makes the difference um, as time goes on. And so we'll think about that a little bit. And please join in. light is gone and you're on your own you've been trying but the fight doesn't go away and you don't know when the sun will shine again all you gotta do is look my way if you, you got, got a problem, problem I, I got, got a problem, problem too if you're standing at the bottom, I'll reach out for you. If you need someone to lean on, baby, I can be strong. I will carry you through. If you got a problem, I'll be a problem too. Everybody needs something to believe. If you want, you can always put your faith in me. I don't know it all, but I know how it feels to fall. With a helping hand, you can find your feet. 
If you got a problem, I got a problem too. If you're standing at the bottom, I'll reach out for you. If you need someone to lean on, baby, I can be strong and I will carry you through. If you got a problem, I got a problem too. If you're lonely, if you're down and out, holding out for a better day, call up on me and I'll come running and I'll find a better way. Because if you got a problem, I got a problem too. If you're standing at the bottom, I'll reach out for you. If you need someone to lean on, baby, I can be strong and I will help you through. If you got a problem, I got a problem too. Yes, if you got a problem, I got a problem too. And if you need someone to lean on, baby, I can be strong. I will carry you through. If you got a problem, I'll reach out for you. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks for those of you who have stuck it out on Zoom all day with us. We really appreciate it. Um, have a good night.